Louisiana Proud, K-Ball 101.1. Big Al hanging out on a hot afternoon in South Louisiana. 99 degrees, heat index at 120. Speaking of hot, here's a hot new track from Dan Smalley. Born and raised on the bayou. Chief Sons, who's that? It's Dan Smalley. When it comes to authentic country music, it's one of the greatest of all times, if I'm being honest. And I dig Sitting that. on the back porch, guitar picking, little bit of late night whiskey sipping, crawfish pie talking, finger licking, born and raised on the bayou. Washboard rhythm and a bullfrog humming. Daddy sweet apple moonshine coming. Babies and the dogs in the backyard running. Born and raised on the bayou. How I love my Cajun country home. Leave me here and let those good times roll. Talk about muddy waters and cypress stumps. Alligators and backwoods swamps. I'm alive for everyone, born and raised on the bayou. Oh. Mama's in the kitchen cooking something, everybody else in the backyard buzzing. Domino's, horseshoes, cheating and cussing, born and raised on the bayou. Side of cold squeeze box, stomping and clapping, late night moonlight, tugging, laughing. Two men, people, catfish catching, born and raised on the bayou Well, that was born and raised on the bio, but we're at Buckle and Boots where it's wet, it's damp, it's muddy, it's Manchester. Much like a bayou. <laughs> Much like a bayou. And with me, I've got Dan Smalley. Now, Dan, you were actually raised in Fairbanks in Alaska, but actually, you moved around a lot because so you I was different. born in Fairbanks. Yeah, I was yeah. raised all over the place. Though. Yeah. I, Ohio and Louisiana are the two places I've lived. So I spent the most time in my life. Yeah, because your dad was in the U.S. Air Force. Yes, sir. He was a singer. He was a singer. Yeah. You never think of people being in the Air Force and being a singer, but yeah, unless you've been in the uh, in the military and witnessed the bands, you don't even realize that they're part of the military. But yes, it was a very big part of the the United States Air Force for a long time. I don't know if there's still active as many active bands um, as there used to be, um, but at the time he was involved. Right, Pat Air Force Base, the band flight, uh, one of the bigger bands as mm -hmm. far as the military is concerned. Uh, it was a beautiful thing to grow up for. And is that, is that how you got into music because of your dad? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I started playing saxophone in third grade and um, I sang with my dad growing up a little bit. Uh, he was always, uh, anytime he'd be playing like a Christmas show or something like that, and uh, He'd be there. He would pull me onto the stage to come sing like Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer with him and stuff like that. So I've been in front of a lot of people for a long time, and um, I really love it. Right. So when did you pick up a guitar? So I didn't pick up a guitar until I graduated high school. Really, I broke my leg my senior year playing American football um, in five places, and my dad was always like, "What are you gonna do when you can't play football?" Because my my dream slash goal 
um, was to go to college playing American football and um, get my degree and then play music. That way. Um, and I always told my dad, I was just going to be a singer like you are. Um, if I ever get hurt or can't play football anymore, and as soon as I broke my leg. So you've traveled a lot, you've been in lots of places. Where was your favorite place to live? You know, I'll, I love Louisiana and Ohio. I love Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, because when did you move to Nashville? 2017. So seven years. You've got another three to go to make it big. That's the usual, the 10 years. In yeah, Nashville. it's the 10 years now. Um, yeah, Nashville, Tennessee is, is really um, just amazing place as far as music goes, as far as creative uh, creativity goes um, and songwriting specifically. Moving to Nashville is probably the most important decision I ever made um, in my music career, career as far as just um, uh, the creative energy is palpable. So if you're in Nashville and you're not getting better, then there's, there's something wrong. You're not paying attention. You're not doing what you're supposed to do um, because um, all of the greatest musicians and songwriters at this point in, in history, I'm pretty sure Nashville is the mecca of most of the, the music that's it's being something, made. It's something that we don't have in the UK. Absolutely. Um, whereas I think particularly country and in fact Nashville puts out more gospel music than it puts out mm -hmm. country music. Mm -hmm. But it is the mecca for everybody to go to Nashville. It's as far dream. as music is concerned, yeah, I believe right now there's never been a... Um, another place on the planet with as concentrated a scene of just amazing talent. Does that make sense? Like just yeah. the amount of greatness that is in Nashville and now they're working. And is it a friendly town or is it a very competitive town? It's extremely competitive with a um, very business um, kind mentality, if that makes sense. Um, it's very business, um, mm -hmm. most of it. Uh, now. As far as just art is concerned, they're still art lovers and they're still lovers of, of what they might consider great um, talents or, or songs or whatever. But as far as the business is concerned, it's um, at this point, sadly, I think, um, strictly about the dollar, the dollar, the bottom line, and whether or not you're making money. Um, yeah, I'm, the whole I, I art for the sake of art thing is kind of, um, I think. Yeah, I think that, that's past. I and mean, it, it's. The whole business has changed with more uh, streaming and things like that, which makes it very tough on artists because, I mean, for one stream on Spotify, you're getting 0.0034 of a cent. Yeah, it's nothing. You yeah. know, so particularly if you're an independent artist, to try and fund, to record, to make videos is an expensive business and you've got to make an income somehow. And if the record companies aren't sponsoring you because they want instant hits all the time, um, that's a tough game. It's a tough game for sure, yeah. I'm trying to, to fund everything yourself. I've had some help um, with a distribution company to put this record out for sure, but the amount of money that I have invested in it to rely on the digital service providers to recoup that money, um, unless I go viral or become Morgan Wallen overnight, you know what I mean? It's, it's not a realistic goal. Mm -hmm. So at this point in my career, um, it feels as if I'm pushing music and being funded um, and, and then having to, you know, kind of recoup and, and pay back these funds um, from a streaming royalty that is less than trickling in, if that makes sense. It, it's more of a, uh, of a slow drip. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's the same in the US, but in the UK, for an artist to release a single, make a video, they're going to need to get a million streams to just pay back the cost of setting it all up. Easy. So, you know, that, that's hard going. Yeah. Now, you <coughs> mentioned the new album there. Um, first track, Born and Raised on the Bio, is on that album. Mm -hmm. The next track I was going to play was The State of Country Music. Mm -hmm. Now, when I first saw the title, I thought, oh, that's a real comment. But actually, it's more of a love song than, than anything else. What were the inspirations behind it? Yeah, just uh, moving to Nashville and, um, and getting um, connected with some agents and, some, and signing some record deals and some publishing deals and um, just seeing how it all worked. And just one evening, I was at a show and with an agent and just talking about, you know, touring and, and whether or not shows would fit together and, and how all that works. And um, 
And I said something like, yeah, man, it's really good. I just, I'm not 100% sure, you know, that the, our shows would make sense together as far as like what people are, look, are going to a show. But I don't know anything. So I was just, just saying it out loud. And, and the person at the time was like, well, that's just the state of country music we're in right now. And, and you thought, that's a name for a song. Absolutely. Immediately, I, yeah. <laughs> I think, let's play it. When I hear that lonesome whistle start to cry It reminds me of the rain in those blue eyes The goodbye keeps on hurting While the whiskey still ain't working near enough to keep old Georgia off my mind Sometimes it takes a fiddle Sometimes a steel guitar Sometimes it takes a back road A church pew or a bar The happy to the heart Ever after all depends On the state of country music I'm in There's a place inside my head Where I like to go Where minor notes make sense And the highs feel low The comfort that I find In the harmony and rhyme Live between the lines that all my heroes wrote Sometimes it takes a Sometimes a steel guitar Sometimes it takes a back road A church pew or a bar The happy to the heartbreak Ever after all depends On the state of country music I'm in Country music I'm in Right, now, State of Country Music, as I say, more of a love song in many ways. You're in the UK. This is the second time in the UK. How are you finding both the audiences and your reception in the UK? You know, I started coming to Denmark in 2021 and the reception and the reaction from people in Denmark is much like the, the it's almost identical to what I found in, in Europe as far as the way people receive um, the live shows mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then hold on to you once they find you and become a fan. Um, and follow you around all the shows. Like it's, it's, um, it's so heartwarming. Um, if that it's, it feeds my soul to come over here and my spirit as a musician, um, to come over here and feel that and, and experience it. It just makes me want to come back, but I've had nothing but amazing experiences since I've, I've come here. And since I've gone to Denmark, I go to Sweden next week. Um, I'm just, I love it over here to be honest with you. It's good. And how are you finding Buckland and Boots your first time at a British festival? You know, this is not what I was expecting, to be honest with you. When I Good or bad, not what you're expecting. Oh, definitely good. So I, I met everyone in March at um, Country on the Clyde and C2C over in um, Glasgow. And um, and I had heard about Buckle and Boots, but I hadn't been, I hadn't really approached, been approached or um, talked about it. And then um, 
uh, after I got done playing the Country on the Clyde show, uh, Laura Hancock, I believe, was like, he's playing on um, Buckle of Boots. And I was like, all right, let's do it. I'm, I'm here. I'll there. I'm there. I'll be there. Um, and getting here, when they're talking about it, you know, like, it's just a little farm, you know, just a, just a small festival. And I was like, okay, cool. And I pulled up and I was like, they were lying. <laughs> they, there's Laura right there. Matter of fact, wow. Coincidence. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and you did you did your first tour with Jeremy McComb and uh, Gary Quinn. Gary Quinn. Yeah. Jeremy's a hoot. Yes. Was he? Did you know him before you you did that? I tour? did not. No, we had never met. I'd heard of Jeremy for sure, and um, I knew Gary from Nashville Nights, um, and he's this, this one of the sweetest, uh, great artists, great singer songwriter. Like uh, Gary's one of my boys, um, but Jeremy. <laughs> is a different animal and all i did was laugh anytime jeremy and i are around each other all i do is laugh um, because he's one of the funniest people i've ever met not to mention talented uh songwriter singer just a great guy absolutely great guy uh, both those guys um the three of us are playing around i think is it tomorrow yeah tomorrow yeah tomorrow afternoon and just the energy that we have together it's a uh, it's it's how you've got to know each other absolutely. good contrast but we're work well together absolutely yeah we talk a little shit we have fun um it's just a a brotherly love <laughs> definitely a brotherly love now we were talking before about earning a living doing this and how hard it is do you have to tour a lot in the states to to do gigs or do you mainly base yourself around nashville you know if i play shows like actual shows they're probably outside of nashville um I'll do a, a little bit of Broadway work in Nashville. I'll do some um, other acoustic stuff around Nashville to kind of, you know, make some extra cash here and there. Um, but as far as actual band shows go, I'm touring um, outside of Nashville most of the time. Um, yeah, it's just hard to to make money. Yeah. In Nashville, um, so you got a lot of competition there. So uh, it's just they can get whoever you know. They can fill those stages for nothing if they want to. I mean, they do. Yeah. Uh, so it's just one of those things. You have to put yourself um, where you see yourself as far as what you feel like you're worth. Yeah. What is worth your time? What's worth your effort? What is worth you showing up and giving everything you can to possibly connect to people within this this wherever you are? what's worth your time and effort because when i come out to play a show a live show that's me and my fans showing up i'm giving everything i got and if i can't find venues that are going to give me that back then i don't want to be there mm -hmm. to be completely honest with you so sometimes you play shows and it's like yeah why was i even here not really but it's like you know like no, it's it's yeah, and you only find that out after the event when you've got or during it yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I haven't had that experience in the UK yet. I haven't had one show in London or or England or Denmark where I walked away saying that was absolutely horrible. Like I why are we even there? This was um every show, every single person in the audience was there and there for the experience of the show. Mm -hmm. Um and if you give me that, if you're you if you're there with back. me, I will give it Ten times back to you. Now, album out. Another song on there which I like is a song called "Accidentally Drunk." Yeah. What was the motivation behind that? Yeah, so that was a write with Ashley McBride and Justin Ebock, and I walked in with a title called "Mr. Jerry's Ghost" that I was really excited about. Yeah, we'll come to Mr. Jerry's yeah, Ghost. Yeah, we'll get to later. that one later. Um, but I kind of laid it out for him, and it was a bunch of verses that were already kind of written, and I just I needed help arranging and and coming up with a couple maybe extra lines and um by the end of it they were like that's done just just take it and, and finish it and i was like okay cool and justin in the middle of that was like i got, I got this idea um accidentally drunk maybe and i was like that's a really cool title um and it was one of the lines i had said in my in the jerry's ghost um, versus kind of thing i was like and it would kind of connect to that so in my head i was thinking all right, let's do it. Let's just go. And I'm always like, yes, let's go positively. And we finished it. And I remember leaving thinking, that's a cool tune. And then I got the demo that Ashley made and, and I was floored. 
just like, wait a minute, this is a great tune. And then just listening to it. And then the next day I bumped into Terry Joe box and I had this idea called Mr. Jerry's ghost and, and we finished it. So those two days were written simultaneously. Or those two songs were written one day after the other. Um, and after I finished Jerry's ghost, listening to accidentally drunk, I was like, these songs have to live together. And I'd already seen the music videos in my head. Like how I was going to put so it do, together. Do you um, make the music videos? Or I did get- make those. Yes. It was a very cool process. And it was the first time that I had the opportunity to kind of get behind a camera and, and be like, yes, this is what I'm looking for, right? This is what I see. This is this vision that I have. This is what I that's want. That's really to neat at. tying it up with the song as well. I, that's a great excuse. Let's play Accidentally Drunk. I was tired of waking up to another hang. Trying to get high, ending up a little lower Swearing it's the last time Like every other Friday night I was doing better staying out of the deep end Hadn't had a sip since Labor Day week And I pat myself on the back Cause I was pretty proud of that But I could only fight your memory sober so long Till I start thinking about you Wondering where you're at Jump in a truck Drive too fast Don't get far End up at the bar Blow it in park That's where it starts with a two-finger pull Telling this glass of tequila I'm only drinking it until I don't need you But oh, next thing I know Sun's coming up And I'm accidentally drunk Wake up and get back on the wagon Head still pounding, ass still dragging I'll probably be alright Yeah, until the next time I start thinking about you Wondering where you're at Jump in a truck, drive too fast Don't get far, end up at the bar Throw it in park That's where it starts with a two-finger pull Telling this glass of tequila I'm only drinking it until I don't need you But oh, next thing I know The sun's coming up And I'm accidentally drunk Accidentally drunk I wasn't trying to sip on something so strong But I could only fight your memory so for so long Till I start thinking about you Wondering where you're at Jump in a truck Drive too fast Don't get far End up at the bar Flowing in part That's where it starts with a two-finger pull Telling this glass of tequila I'm only drinking it until I don't need you But oh, next thing I know Sun's coming up, and I'm accidentally drunk. Accidentally drunk. Now, before we played that video, you were saying about you wrote the two songs close together and actually Mr. Jerry's Ghost came first. Now, both are linked to alcohol and you've had your challenges with alcohol mm-hmm. over the years, but you've given up drinking for 10 years now? Yep, almost. That's pretty damn November good. November will be 10 years, yeah. Yeah, each day is, a, is a, an extra step, which is great. Mm-hmm. But the story with Mr. Jerry's Ghost, I think, it, or behind Mr. Jerry's Ghost is particularly poignant. Do you want to talk us through that? Yeah, so I guess the reason Accidentally Drunk sets up Mr. Jerry's Ghost is because I actually got accidentally drunk um, and blacked out in 2014 and um, couldn't get in my house uh, with my keys, so I, I kicked the door down, and it was not my home. <laughs> and the man that owned the home shot me with a forty caliber pistol. 
uh, in the chest and in the arm. I was pronounced dead on the scene. Um, and they say, I, I just sat up in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. I was like, what, what happened? And, um, I woke up in a hospital bed with, um, three doctors telling me that I'm the luckiest guy that they met. And if I didn't know how I got in there, that I probably had a very real problem. Um, and this was not the first, uh, almost tragic incident that I had been through as an alcoholic. Um, it wasn't the second. So this was, this was the, the God slap that it took though for me to just finally put it all down and never Do ever touch it again. <laughs> Do you think you survived because you were drunk in a way? You know, the doctor said, had I not had, had I not been so, um, drunk that I might not have made it. But the fact that I was, my body went into shock apparently after I was shot and just shut down and apparently, um, that's what helped me live through it. Yeah. Apparently. And the fact that this one just kind of bounced around and they were both full metal jackets. So they just kind of went through instead of coming in and blowing up. Um, they, uh, so they just went straight. This one bounced a bunch and missed some vital organs. And this one just went straight through my arm. I, I spent two weeks in the hospital and I uh, got out and took him Thanksgiving dinner and apologized. Um, because I felt horrible and couldn't begin to understand what it might feel like to have to pull the trigger at it on a human. Um, and the first thing he said to me was, you know, I'm usually a better shot. <laughs> and you're saying, thank God you weren't that night. No, I said, well, sir, you hit me twice. So, uh, <laughs> you didn't miss. Um, but he's like, you're lucky to still be here. And I was like, yes, sir. I'm, I'm very lucky. And did you, did you form a relationship with him after that? No, um, I, uh, paid to get his doors fixed and Mr. Jerry, um, passed away shortly after of a cardiac arrest. That's a shame. It was a shame. After talking to him though, he's, uh, I don't know if he was happy that I lived through it. Yeah. Cause you broke into his house. Well, yeah, I think it was one of those things. I don't know. Uh, it feels weird, but like just meeting him and knowing that he spent so much time in the gun range. Matter of fact, he had just left the gun range the night before, which is the reason he had his practice rounds in and almost practicing for that moment. And when it didn't go down the way he wanted it to, maybe mm -hmm. I feel like he was kind of upset about it. If that makes sense. Like the fact that I was still alive kind of upset him. Like maybe he was just waiting around for an opportunity to kill somebody and then he got it and it didn't and work. It, and it didn't work. I can't ask any questions after that. <laughs> so I think let's play Mr. Jerry's ghost. Five a.m. A baby cries. A handgun fires outside across the street. A woman wakes up from her sleep. He's been away since yesterday. She knows he's probably drunk, and now she's wide awake, watching the lights flash out the window as she tries to calm the baby down. Hoping it's not her missing husband on the ground He wakes up with a hurting head Handcuffed to a hospital bed And a long line of people happy he's still alive Pacing back his misplaced steps With one long instance wiped clean from his head he might be better off dead Cause the headlines print almost tragedy Drunk man breaks in accidentally Sixty-eight, 
gun club in our race stamped on his license plate. Dropped the charges the same day. He said he's usually a better shot. He said he might have had a second thought, hard to know for sure. With someone kicking down your door. But lucky for that boy, the bullets missed his heart. It's hard to recognize your drunk ass neighbor in the dark. The young man paid the damage off, hadn't had one drop since those two shots. Supposed to kill him dead, somehow saved his life instead. But January brought a bit of rain, the sirens came, and this time they were just too late. Oh man, Jerry's heart gave way. Now every morning the boy stares down the road and says a prayer for Mr. Jerry's gold.